The story of trap music starts after T.I.'s debut album, I'm Serious. This album would release under Arista Records in October of 2001. Unfortunately for T.I., this album was a commercial failure, peaking at number 98 on the Billboard Hot 100. T.I.'s manager, Jason Geeter, said that while T.I. was on Arista, he wasn't a priority. At this point, there were so many major acts on the label at the time that it had not reached the radar of L.A. Reid, who was the CEO and president of the label. Things would really get sour when T.I. released the first single for his debut album, and that would fail to chart on the Billboard Hot 100. Warm my arms frozen, pitching me in the room for the gun chosen. Pitching me with no PO and no dro. Pitching pills brought with some bras and they getting no throw. So, this single would not chart at all on the Billboard charts, and the first week sales for TI's debut album would be abysmal. After this, according to Jason, LA Reed did not want to promote another single for the album. He felt that the album was already over with and that TI needed to go back and make another album. This confused TI's team because to them, people were loving his album in the south but that wasn't enough so they were told to make another one to make matters even worse for ti there was a man who initially signed him to the label and his name was kawan prather eventually kawan ended up leaving arista to work for columbia records which put ti on his own there was no longer someone on the label who really supported him and what he was trying to do due to the lack of support ti would start making things pop himself with one instance being him him paying for a music video for the song Doughboys without Arista's knowledge. From doing research, there are some sources that say that T.I. was dropped from Arista, while others say that he asked for his release from the label. T.I. and his team say that they asked for their release, which ended up being granted. Either way, T.I. would get off of Arista and back to the independent grind. When talking about this time period, T.I. has said that there were multiple times that he thought about quitting music. After his debut album failed, he wondered if music was really for him. He contemplated going back to the streets, but a lot of people depended on him, so he tried his best to make the rap thing work. The underground success of the song Doughboys from his debut album sparked a realization with T.I. and his team that people were really loving the street music. But before I get any more into the video, I would quickly like to plug that I made a TikTok that you guys should definitely go follow. I'll be posting content on there. I'm trying to get that popping, so definitely go out and support that. And if you guys already haven't done it yet, go follow my Instagram too. That would be greatly appreciated. You guys can always reach out and just show me some love. It's all good. But after T.I. realized that people wanted street music, he hit the ground running with the PSC, which is the Pimp Squad Click. This is a group that T.I. is in, and would appear on his debut album on the song Heavy Chevys. In 2002, the group would release their first mixtape titled In The Streets. The very next year, in 2003, the group would release two mixtapes. The first one being In The Streets Part 2, then came the release of In The Streets Part 3. This was when the mixtape scene was popping and doing this would build up a lot of buzz for T.I. In 2003, him and his longtime manager would also form Grand Hustle Records, which down the line went on to sign acts like Travis Scott, B.O.B., and A-Ball and M.J.G. When speaking about the intention of the album Trap Music, T.I. said that it was to make sure that people coming from all walks of life would be motivated by being able to relate to someone. If T.I. can make it out of the hood, then anyone can. He was different coming out of Atlanta compared to Outkast, So So Def, Lil Jon and the Eastside Boys, Goody Mob, and many more. When T.I.'s manager first met him, he saw this and he would further say, you gotta think, this is Atlanta in the late 90s. At the time, every rapper in Atlanta had the same look. Gold teeth, tattoos, dreadlocks, all kind of stuff. Everyone followed the Outkast and Goody Mob blueprint, whereas he didn't have any of that, so I didn't even think he was the rapper that I was coming to meet. He had a clean look still does no tattoos none of that extra stuff just a polo shirt jean shorts air max sneakers that was his look to me there was definitely an appeal i said he's a fly young kid but he was smart and could actually hold a conversation but he still has the ability to rhyme and girls like him for me it was a no-brainer ti would end up making a huge splash at the beginning of 2003 when he appeared on bone crusher's song never scared this song would end up peaking at number 26 on the billboard how 100. On a mainstream level, this was a lot of people's first time hearing T.I. and he did not disappoint with his verse. He definitely showed out. The same month that Never Scared was released as a single, T.I. would drop the first single for his debut album, which was the song 24s. 
To this day, I swear that this song gave me extra speed on Need for Speed Underground, which was my game back in the day. I used to love it when this song came on during the game. But the song 24s ended up peaking at number 78 on the Billboard Hot 100. With the success of the song 24s, things were looking up for T.I. He was now featured on a top 30 song on the Billboard Hot 100 charts and had a song on the Billboard Hot 100 charts as a lead artist. This was a drastic change compared to how things were with his debut album. And with this, T.I. would drop his sophomore album, Trap Music, in August of 2003. This album would peak at number four on the Billboard 200, selling over 110,000 copies in its first week. Now there does happen to be some controversy behind the name of the album Trap Music. This is due in part to who quote unquote invented trap music. In 2018, T.I. and Gucci Mane would have a disagreement about this. Gucci would take to his Instagram to post that he invented trap music. T.I. would respond to this by posting his album trap music and saying that it was actually him who started it. Gucci released his debut album Trap House in 2000 while T.I. released his album Trap Music in 2003. T.I. will further talk about this in an interview with Vice. He is just being an alpha male and trying to dominate everything. This is something that can be dominated by words and words alone. To say you created this, you'd have to beat me to the punch. I don't want to take away from his contribution as it was significant. Gucci took Trap to a different place. Young Jeezy and them did too. But there isn't Trap music without me. Gucci knows this. There are some people that say that Trap music was around before T.I., but he was just the one who simply coined the phrase Trap music. I'm not here to argue whether he did or not but i definitely felt like it should be mentioned in this video especially with how prevalent trap music is in rap today if you want to learn more about this topic what trap is and its origins i highly suggest that you go watch this video on the screen by soundfield i'll put a link in the description for you guys the last thing that's a fun fact that i would like to mention is the cover art for trap music the cover art was shot in the now abandoned dixie hills apartment complex in west atlanta zone one but this will wrap up the first part of the video where I discuss the backstory leading up to trap music. In the second part of the video, I'll break down the history behind each track on the album. The first track on the album is self-titled After the Album. This features Mac Boney. Aside from being a member of the Pimp Squad clique and being featured on the album, Mac is integral in the backstory behind trap music through his mother. According to T.I.'s manager, 90% of this album was made in the back of Mac Boney's mom's hair salon. DJ Toomp would have production credits on the first track on trap music with him previously working on T.I.'s debut album. In an interview, DJ Toomp would say, Tip actually created that track and then I came in and finished it up. Tip produced too, if you give him a drum machine and a keyboard, he can get it down. That's what also makes him an overall good artist. He gets it. He understands the artist side and the production side of the game. The same aspects that made Kanye what he is. I was there for really the whole album, even the stuff that I didn't produce. I was there just to make sure everything went well as far as the delivery, the lyrics, and the direction. The self-titled track then fades into the song, I Can't Quit. This track addresses that T.I. will not quit despite the commercial failure that was his debut album. Most would fold after what happened to him, but he persevered through it all. I largely talked about the backstory behind this track at the beginning of the video, so we'll just go ahead to the next track, which is Be Easy. This would end up being the second single off of the album, but it ultimately failed to chart on the Billboard Hot 100. DJ Toomp would also produce this track, and he noted that Shawty Red, who produced for Young Jeezy early on, would be heavily influenced production-wise by this song. T.I. named the track Be Easy because it was a term that him and one of his friends used to say to each other back in the day. In fact, a lot of the things that he rapped about on this record were things that him and his friend would say to each other. The song No More 
more talk would follow be easy and this is one of ti's more political records with this record ti really wanted to take the opportunity to get in the booth and share his political views sanchez holmes would produce this track and would say he had something on his chest he wanted to get off he was done with talking about it and wanted to let it be known like i ain't speaking about it no more it's done they can take it how they want to he was the high-headed street dude you couldn't tell him nothing man he didn't just say that on the song he meant that and you know it was all for real stuff like that was happening on the daily like every record came out that same day something was being dealt with after no more talk we had one of ti's favorite songs that he's ever made which is doing my job this is also one of my favorite songs on the album hey. This song means so much to T.I. because he knows that there are a lot of people who were willing to say the same thing as he did on the record but didn't know how to articulate it. Kanye West would produce this track marking the first time that him and T.I. have ever worked together. Feeling like the album already had enough southern presence production wise, T.I.'s team decided to look at different producers. Pre-college dropout Kanye was selected. DJ Toon felt like Kanye brought balance to the album. Kanye ended up producing two tracks on the album the other one we'll talk about in a little bit let's get away featuring jazzy faye would end up being the sixth song on trap music this would be the last single that was released for the album with it peaking at number 35 on the billboard hot 100 not only would jazzy faye feature on the track but he would produce it as well he met ti through dj toomp and kawan prather ti would reach out to jazzy faye because he wanted the song for the ladies on this album i tried to sample aretha franklin's day Dreaming, I had originally done the record singing that same melody. They were like, we couldn't use it because we couldn't get it cleared in time. So I changed the melody and I made my own melody out of it, and people really gravitated toward the melody I changed it to. Then when the video came out, they changed it back. That was an executive decision, which I thought we didn't really need. I didn't think we needed the sampled version because our fans didn't really know that record anyway. So it's not like there's no real nostalgia for them with the record. After Let's Get Away, we get back to back bangers on the album starting off with 20 foes when asked about this song ti would say that after his debut album flopped people in his corner were telling him that he needed to dumb down his lyrics if you listen to 20 foes you can tell he really dumbed it down this proved to work in his favor with the song peaking at number 78 on the billboard hot 100 ti's manager credits this song as to how ti ended up getting signed to atlantic records Prior to the deal, the song was already in the streets, which caused the bidding war for T.I. A week after signing to Atlantic is when T.I. shot the video for 20 Foes. While 20 Foes was a hot song, the next song on the album would be T.I.'s highest charting song as a lead artist at the time. It would be the song Rubber Band Man, and this ended up being the third single on the album. Rubber Band Man, why is the Taliban rolls on my right, get the large in my other hand. Hey, the song would be produced by David Banner. He would meet T.I. through the rapper Bone Crusher. David Banner would get the opportunity to play some beats for T.I., which he ended up really liking. At the time, David Banner was really broke trying to make things happen for himself. T.I. told me, he said, listen, Banner, I have to basically take care of everybody that's around me. If you work with me on the price for these beats, I'll make it worth your while. I promise you that. I drove from Mississippi to Atlanta to work with him. Just about everybody in Atlanta that was hot during that time heard that beat and T.I. was the only one who picked it. I remember Mr. DJ, who was the DJ for Outkast, said to me, Banner, you two years ahead of everybody, you just have to be patient. T.I. was one of the people who had the vision to see it before those two years were up. T.I. would actually stand up for David Banner as well. David Banner would put his producer tag at the beginning of the beat, but when the songs that he produced played on the radio, they would cut off his producer tag. It was T.I. who stood up for him and demanded the radio stations to not take off his tag. David Banner also has talked about how the song brightened up urban music from the south and how it also changed his career. 
After he did this beat, people were lining up to work with him. T.I.'s manager would further say that Rubber Band Man was a turning point. It showed the world what was going on in the South. He would also reveal that Diddy wanted to sign T.I. to Bad Boy Records bad. It's really not hard to believe, especially with Diddy going on to start Bad Boy South. As to why the song is titled Rubber Band Man, it's very simple. The title is in reference to T.I.'s days of drug dealing. The goal was to get the rubber bands off of your wrist and into your pockets as you make money doing what drug dealers do. The last thing I do have to say about this song is that it could have been slightly different. T.I. originally wanted to sample the spinner song The Rubber Band Man. After sampling this song for the original track, it didn't hit like T.I. and his team wanted it to. Things would change when T.I. heard David Banner's beat for what we have today. Following Rubber Band Man, we have Look What I Got. The inspiration for this track came from how T.I. felt about how his first album wasn't rated as he hoped. He felt like the people reviewing his album didn't know what they were listening to and he wanted to set the record straight. He was a man on a mission on this record, separating himself from others. However, the mood of the album would soon change with the next track, I Still Love You. About the importance of the track, T.I. would say, It was emotional making that song because my father had just died or was about to die. He had Alzheimer's, diabetes, and high blood pressure, so he was really hurting. Even though he had Alzheimer's, he knew me when I came around. I remember he kept telling me the same things he would tell me when I was a kid, like I was still a kid. But sometimes he recognized I was grown, like when I brought around my two sons, Messiah and Damani. The first verse of the song is about the mother of his sons, Messiah and Damani. He opened up about his infidelity and how he was young when everything between them occurred. The second verse is about how T.I. had resented his father for a long time before his father got sick. T.I. felt like his father was able to prevent him from having to go through what he went through as a kid. He felt like his father was very well off financially. As good as the song is though, there was a possibility that it could have never came out. The track would be produced by Nick Lofton, aka Nick Fury. He would meet T.I. and end up giving him a CD full of his beats. Nick would leave Atlanta and a year later, he would come back and run into T.I.'s manager. His manager would tell Nick that T.I. was working on an album, but there was a song that they had no clue who did the beat for it. Nick would then go to the studio to find out that it was his beat that he left for T.I. a year previous. It was a demo version of the song at the time, but it would eventually get fleshed out to the version that we ended up getting on the album. Earlier, I mentioned that Kanye would produce another song on Trap Music and that would end up being the song, Let Me Tell You Something. There's not much history behind this track outside of it being dedicated to T.I.'s now wife, Tiny. The song T.I. vs. Tip would follow after this with T.I. being the rapper version of him and Tip being an alter ego. T.I.'s nickname growing up was Tip and that went on to be his rap name. When T.I. was signed to Arista, it was L.A. Reid who told him to change his name. This was to not get the name of Tip to be confused with Q-Tip who was also signed to Arista Records. Some of the people around T.I. weren't feeling the name change. There were even some people who wanted him to change his name back to Tip when he left Arista and he went on a sign to Atlantic. The names of both T.I. and Tip represent good and bad parts of his own personality. He just turned this into a conversation between two people, which is how he got the song T.I. vs. Tip. Something that is very noticeable about the album trap music is that it lacks features. The next track, Bezel, contains three out of the five people featured on the album, not counting the bonus song. This also includes A Ball and MJG as individuals on Bezel. Bun B would also be featured on the song as well. T.I. really wanted to get people he respected to feature on the album. The song is built around a sample from a song called I'm So Tired, which would be cut from T.I.'s debut album. This song would fade into King of the South, which is a song that T.I. would boldly proclaim himself to be the King of the South. About this song, T.I. would be interviewed and he would explain that him and his friend Kawan Prather would be listening to one of Mystical's albums when they heard Mystical call himself the Prince of the South. T.I. wondered if Mystical was the Prince of the South, then who was the King? Kawan would tell T.I. that there had been no King of the South to that point. Kawan noticed that upon saying this, T.I.'s face started to change. That same night, T.I. went to the studio and recorded the song Two Glock Nines. This song would end up appearing on the soundtrack for the 2000 film Shaft. Kawan would a and this project. 
on the song ti would call himself the king of the south so this was three years before he titled a song after this when T.I. originally said that he was the king of the south, it didn't have as much value to him until people started saying that he could not say it. It caught the attention of the streets, but it would also catch the attention of the pioneers in the south. T.I. would say that he went to who people deem legends in the south like Goody Mob, Outkast, Bun B, and MJG to have a discussion. He said that these people did not have a problem with him calling himself the king of the south and as we know years later scarface wouldn't have a problem with it as well the name was something to live up to and wasn't meant to be disrespectful he wanted to carve out his own lane from the mold in the south at the time a fun fact about the song is that tiny sang the background for this song be better than me would end up being the second to last track on the album not much history behind this track but the premise of the song is that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel don't walk the same path as someone and end up doing better than the example that they've already set. Long Live The Game is the last track on the album. If you ever heard this song, you would get the story and the message that T.I. is trying to convey. And just like that, we're done with this album. After releasing this album, T.I. would feel drastically different from when he released his debut album. After Trap Music, we all know what became of T.I.'s career. With his back against the wall, T.I. managed to drop a classic album controlling his own destiny. All in all, this is simply a fantastic album. What is your favorite song or songs from this project? Is it a classic? Why or why not? Let me know in the comment section below. Where were you at in life when this album dropped? Definitely let me know because those are some of my favorite comments. But anyways, let me know in the comment section. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.